Hey, what's up, guys? This is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I interview Travis Mash, one of the strongest Americans of all time. Um, he was a competitive powerlifter as well as weightlifter, and now he's putting together one of the best weightlifting clubs in the country and what could become kind of a new you know, Olympic training center. Um, so we talk a lot about training, lifestyle, mindset as it, res- as it relates to building strength and competing at a high level, um, how he goes about coaching his elite athletes, etc. Before we get started, if you love this show and you haven't done, done so already, please head to iTunes, leave me a review. I'd appreciate it very much. And also, if- I'm going to invite any of you that are interested to call into a voicemail that I have set up and leave some questions. So then I'm going to play back your question on the podcast and I'm either going to answer the question myself or I'm going to get one of my guests to help me answer those questions. If you're interested, the number is 801-449-0503. That's 801-449-0503. Thanks and enjoy the show. What's up, everybody? I'm here with Travis Mash, one of the strongest Americans in history and one of the best weightlifting coaches in the country right now as well travis thanks so much for making some time for me brother no problem man like i said you know now you're family now that you're married to a d i have to like you now Not that's right that's right I like you this way. <laughs> appreciate it man so let's start out by talking about your your lifting club and i think they call it the farm um it's not a coincidence that you have several of the top weightlifters in the country right now. Um, you know, maybe you know, one in a in a club is it could be a coincidence, but you're consistently bringing in the top talent in the country. So why are they coming to you? What's so special about uh, this place that they call the farm? And you know, uh, I wish I could pinpoint it because then I could like sell it to all the other coaches, but. You know, I, I would like to think, and a D can, um, you know, she can tell you what, what she thinks. But, you know, I think it's just we have a great fam- family atmosphere. Um, for example, Thanksgiving, the entire team is coming to the farm, and we're going to do Thanksgiving together. You know, the, most of my team, bro, they're not even from here. They're from, I mean, like uh, Nathan is from um, Kansas, Tom is from Missouri. I mean, uh, you know, Jackie is from Wisconsin, and so from the, they're from all over the country and um they're not gonna be going home for thanksgiving with the american open two weeks away so we're all going to do life together so i think that togetherness has a lot to do with it and just i'm a little different than the other coaches you know i'm not so you know stern i'm not so much like a drill sergeant like we have a lot of fun and you know if you're going to do weightlifting you know you got to have fun because you're snatching clean jerking squatting every day so if you don't take some time to have fun you'll go crazy Right. So you're kind of, I mean, what you're doing is you're connecting with these, with these guys way more than the average coach might be, right? You're, uh, you, you, yes. you're getting in their, in their lives, you're intertwining with their lives. And that probably has something to do with why they buy into your program so much. Wouldn't you think? I mean, I would like to believe that. I mean, um, it's even cool when I think about like, look at a D she's going on. I mean, she still does weightlifting, but now she's, um, got working against gravity and you know she got a a million dollar company you know john north he was with me now he's out doing big things jared interchant now he's doing big things Mm -hmm. greg knuckles i mean that dude's been in forbes magazine i mean so like you know it's important that my athletes know that it's not just what they can do for me as an athlete like i want to grow them as a human being i want to see them go on after weightlifting after powerlifting and do great things and you know i think they see that they see my other athletes doing that and me trying to help them do what they want to do and it's just a little di- bit different you know um if you've talked to the other coaches in america a lot of them it's just about you know not all of them because i have plenty of great friends but there are coaches out there that's all about like what the athlete can make them look like or how cool the athlete can make right. them you know so they can go out and tell everyone hey i'm you know i've coached five olympians so i'm the smartest dude in the united states and to me it's not like that i mean i've been my own athlete you know, I don't need a I don't need another athlete to make me look cool. I've done my own stuff, you know. That's really powerful. And it's funny you say that, that part about kind of investing in them. Cause a D and I, I, I interviewed a D again on the podcast, 
and she talked about doing the same thing with her employees, right? And when they see her investing so much in their education, in their kind of desire to to master their their skill, their their craft, they want to work harder for her, right? They they want to be they're, they're more bought into the whole process of being a working against gravity employee and community member and it's like it sounds like the same exact thing as you're doing, right? You're you're taking their entire lives into account. And so they just, they, you know, they're more bought into you as a person and thus your program. I think that's yeah. awesome. I've watched the D do that. And like, uh, you know, it's, I think she's better at doing it with her employees than I am. Say my employees in my company, but she does a great job of, I feel like of doing with her people. Like I would do with my team. I think, um, I'm better at the team part than I am the employee part. Right, right. Well, I mean, you're, you know, you're leading with the team, you've, you've led by example, for years and years and years, same, same with your business, right? You've, you've, uh, you've set world records, uh, you've broken records in, in multiple sports, and yeah. you continue to push in business, uh, business and, and stuff like that. I'm trying, you know, like I think uh, as a D can attest, wait, you can attest to this. I think a lot of athletes, um, if they're able to make that transition, a lot of high level great athletes can use the same exact, you know, um, traits that they use in their sport, in their business. I mean, really, my sport, I mean, my business has become my sport. It's like, you know, I'm trying to set PRs in the products that I come out with, you know, like, right. you know, it's, um, it's one big you know, game to me in a, in a good way, you know, a game that where I get to help other people. So sure. it's, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think the, the defining factor or, or one of them that, uh, you know, may allow a, a former elite athlete to do really well in business as opposed to fail in business is, is, are they entitled to success or not? Right. Do they feel like, you know, I've worked so hard in sport, I'm entitled to to this success, <laughs> or am I going to use the same principles that I use to, uh, you know, excel in sport, to excel in business? I think that's kind of, that's a that's a huge piece that a lot of people miss. Man, that's huge. I mean, that's a great point. And I never, never even really thought about that. But, you know, as the type of athlete I was, I was never really given anything. I mean, I was born, obviously, with decent genetics. But like I was a five foot seven white guy, so to play college football, you know, right. at the D, at the D one level, like I had to work twice as hard as everyone else. Nobody gave me anything. You know, if you're six six and and you're two hundred and seventy five pounds and you're pretty fast, you're probably going to get a scholarship just because they think that they can make you into a great football player. But if you're, you know, if you're five foot seven, dude, you better run a four three forty and right. twice as good as everyone. So, you know, um, I've never felt that, you know. Um, you know, like I deserve anything. I've always felt, you know, this, I've always had this chip on my shoulder and I always felt like I needed to prove everything. And, you know, so I guess I came into business, you know, the same way I went into sports. Absolutely. It definitely shows. Um, so I've heard, I've heard through the grapevine that a, a lot of your kids, they love to play video games and occasionally they will go in and train at some like absurd hour, like 1 a.m. Is that yeah. what's up with that? You know, they, they don't do it as much now. Uh -huh. Like when, when we were a smaller team, like Nathan and Dylan and Tom, you know, at one point really, you know, um, well, let me give you history on it. Like I was with muscle driver mm -hmm. and then when, when I left, I left muscle driver before the collapse, thank God. But you know, when I left, I mean, I pretty much started all over again because you know, I was gone. And so I had Nathan, um, Damron and Dylan Cooper. And from there we grew, but, when it was early on and I just had Nathan and Dylan and uh, then Tom Suma came, there might have been one, you know, one or two other people. Yeah, I was pretty – I was a little bit more lenient. And, right. yeah, they would – you know, some sometimes they would play video games until the – you know, uh, and they would sleep in so late that they would go train at midnight. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I love it. I don't think uh, I don't think some of the older lifters could get away with that, but those young bucks can do just about anything they want, it sounds like. Well, they're slowing down. You know, Nathan, Nathan and Dylan is kind of leading leading that pack on that. Right. But they're they're getting you know Nathan's twenty now, and you know they're starting to they're in there at three o'clock now every day. So a little bit little a lot of things have changed right. for the better. <laughs> so with OTC shutting down this year, um, 
what do you think is the future of American weightlifting? And and like I was saying before the before we started recording, I, I don't not in terms of USAW as an organization, but what does the future look like for American weightlifters without a place to basically get paid to train? Well, I mean, lately now there's you know there's there's at least two places. You know, there's mine and there's Juggernaut where we stipend the athletes ourselves, mm-hmm. and so, um, you know, we're we're just going to have to look. At, you know, let me be honest. America was grown, you know, from capitalism, and so, you know, when you do those government funded programs, it kind of goes against like the nature that Amer- Americans have. I mean, you know, we want to grow something ourselves. We don't want government to give us anything. So I think, you know, if done correctly, Michael, it could be better. You take. You know, a company like mine, if if um, people start to support it and, and it grows and grows, and then I will pay my athletes more and more. And so the potential for my athletes is bigger than ever was at the Olympic Training Center. And that juggernaut, same thing. Like Chad Smith is, you know, now that, you know, um, you have the internet entrepreneurs like you, like me and Chad, like it's, it's kind of endless, you know, the potential for these athletes now. And so I think it could be better. It's just it's a matter of how we handle it. Now, I would like to see, you know, it'd be cool if, like, the government, you know, USAW could make sure they support the people that are actually trying to do it, you know, now that they're not, now that they can't do it. So, but um, I think it could, man, we, we got such an opportunity right now because we've got so many great athletes that are up and coming. You know, you obviously, you know, you've got CJ coming to, as long as he can stay in the sport, like, is destined to do better than any American of all time. Right. You know, you got Harrison Morris. He's right behind him. I, I feel that you know Nathan Damron. You know, it's hard. To, he's already uh, just last Friday. He snatched 116, clean and jerk 202 at 20 years old. Jesus, so, I know. Like squats 675 pounds. You know, that's just, just knee sleep. You know, knee <laughs> sleeves and, and a little and a little flimsy belt. And uh, you know, I've got a 13 year old who's back squatting 400 pounds. You know, and that when I say back squatting 400 pounds, like he's capable of probably 450. But a 13 you know, year old, yeah, thir- yeah, he smoked 400. Shut the fuck up. That's yeah. insane. How With big per- is this kid? He's a he's going to. Be, I think eventually he'll be, um, you know, heavyweight. But he's probably 180 pounds. Yeah. And God, um, damn. And he's big. He's. I mean, he's just. And, but you know what's cool, man? As long as he's big, but he moves. I mean, he moves like right. like Nathan. Like he moves so smoothly and so quickly. And so I'm hoping that for the first time, America will have a great heavyweight that started when they're young mm-hmm. and that will be, you know, trained up properly to, to do some really Hell big. Yeah. yeah. I love that, man. And, and you know, what's really cool is that uh, it sounds like young kids in your area are going to have some really good role models to look up to, uh, which is just going to create just so much more momentum around there. Right. Uh, for, you know, that way you're training people for years and years and years. And that's what has produced Olympians, not people starting at 18 necessarily, but people that are starting at 12, 13 years old. That's, I mean, that's what, and then now in America, if we can go out and recruit, which everyone is starting to talk about it and slowly we're starting to do it, we're starting to formulate systems. If we can go out there and recruit and then we've got these other athletes to say, Hey, look what they've been able to do. I mean, look at CJ, for example, like, not only does he get the the three thousand dollar a month stipend that USAW set aside, but you know he's signed by Reebok, and so you can say, "Look, what this kid was able to do." And, and the thing here's another thing that a lot of people will say, uh, "Oh, we'll never be great at weightlifting because all of our great athletes are going to the you know NFL." Well, that's a you know if anyone has ever been to an NFL practice, which I get to go a lot. This is my best friend's the head strength and uh, conditioning coach for the Panthers. I've been there a bunch, and I haven't seen many five foot nine uh, great athletes on the Panthers. They're all huge, right? Right. Yeah. So that's maybe, a great point. Yeah, yeah. So maybe the one hundred fives and above, you know, maybe the NFL's pulling from, but the ninety fours and down, which is the majority weight classes, they're not being affected at all by the NFL. I promise. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, what would you what would you suggest for? Uh, you know, a high school kid that's getting ready to graduate from high school or, or, or is already graduated that may be one of the best in the country or the best in their area that really wants to make a run at weightlifting as a career. Um, you know, how, how can they set themselves up for success and maybe get on one of these teams like yours or juggernauts? 
Well, I mean, your options would be, you know, um, Juggernaut would be, you know, Mass Mafia weightlifting. You could potentially go to one of the colleges, but the only here's the problem with the colleges, and I'm all for education, but it doesn't. It, it wouldn't appear that they're really turning out the great athletes, and so like that would make me question things a little bit. Like Northern Michigan and you know ETSU, like I would like to see them produce. I would like to see their athletes get there and come out there, come out of there way better. And I'm not seeing that, so like it's hard for me to like really give that push. But what I would like to see those, you know, I'd like to see those college um, uh, teams get better at producing athletes. But so I would like you know shop around, come to you know come to my gym, go to Juggernauts. Um, you know, if you're good enough, I'll follow you out here to check us out. You know, and so you know go see where you fit in because we're way different like you know the culture at my gym is way different than juggernauts it's not one's better than the other it's just different and so like you got to know that you fit in you feel good with the people and then uh you know go there and you know see what kind of support you can get and go from there i love that answer so and that brings me to my next question how how would you stack these up against each other uh the actual training program coaching training uh environment gear uh genetics etc what's what's kind of the most important and least important of those i mean dude i'm not i'm not gonna lie and say that genetics doesn't play an important role like you know there's certain genetic traits if, if you don't have you're in trouble like you know if you don't have the genetics to get somewhat strong and if you don't have the genetics to be somewhat mobile you know you're in trouble you got to have basic you know genetics but then i think hard work can overcome you know certain genetics like uh in our gym like here for, for example let me give you an example you have tom suma and you have nathan damron now nathan's a little bit ahead right now but uh, it's because tom tweaked his back but like they're very different nathan you know squats 675 and tom squats 506 but yet they're both you know neck and neck in the snatch and pretty close in the clean jerk so like you know just you just got to like work harder and be smarter than the other but if you want to know the truth, and let me get right down to it, if you want to know the athlete who becomes great, it's the one who masters the little mundane things. You know, if you can't do that, if you can't become what I call a master of the mundane, mm -hmm. you'll never you'll be good, but you'll never be great. You know, if you can't be the guy that maybe you don't go out when everyone else goes out, if you can't be the guy who makes sure that your nutrition is in check, if you can't be the guy who does the mobility you need to do, right. or if you you can't do, be the guy that, that attacks the little weaknesses that you have, then you'll never be great. And so uh, that, to me, is what separates good from great. Oh, I fucking love that. What, what do you think are what, – what are the characteristics that make someone want to master the mundane? Like what, 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 what do those people have in common that end up doing that kind of stuff in your, in your experience? Man, Michael, in my opinion – there's something in people that want to do that that is so deep within them. It's like something. I mean, uh, I know for me, for example, there was just there was this pit in me that could not be filled because I'd always felt like you know. I, mean, I come from a, a poor family, uh, a broken home, and and I always felt like I had something to prove. I wanted to, you know, to when I left my small town, I wanted to prove to my small town that. Just because we're from a small town in the mountains of North Carolina doesn't mean that we can't do great things. And so there was this, there was this burning, dark pit in the in the very center of my body that would not allow me to to lose. And so, and like I started doing the math. I mean, the, I started thinking about all the different things that I could affect every little bitty thing. And I thought to myself, if I do all those little bitty things, they're going to add up to be way better than everyone else. And so to be that kind of person, to be that driven and to be that obsessed for greatness, you know, something deep inside has to be drawn you to become that. And so and if you don't have that, like, you know, if you grew up probably, if you, I mean, not to mean that, you know, rich kids can't do it, but like if you grew up with a perfect life, you probably don't have anything to prove. And so like, right. but that in my, you know, from what I've seen, you know, that is something that has been there for all the kids that have done great things. That is badass. I uh, I interviewed 
the sports psychologist of the Red Sox a while back, and and he talked about this, uh, you know, the mastering the mundane, doing the small things without fail. And one of the things he said was that if you can attach, if you have a strong sense of purpose, a strong sense of like your your why then you can attach all of those little things, right? You're, you're talking about mobility, nutrition, lifestyle, uh, mindset, et cetera. You can, if you can attach all of that to a purpose, to a strong purpose, then it's not, it doesn't feel like a chore anymore, right? It doesn't even feel mundane. It's just a part of the process. Right. It's and I think, I think nowadays it's, it's so, you know, everybody, everybody's talking about how hard they work and, and, putting uh, videos up on Instagram of how hard they're working and, and how hard they can slam a bar and all of this shit. But <laughs> it's not sexy. It's not sexy to go to sleep a couple hours early or it's not sexy to journal. It's not sexy to eat right. Right. Um, right. So I think it's it's becoming harder and harder these days. And, and you know, a lot of people like li life is probably easier for a lot of people than it was when you were growing up. That way easier, yeah. So I think it's, um, I think people just need to spend some time really thinking about their goals and and why they really want to accomplish these things. And sometimes they might they might find out they don't want it bad enough. When they realize how much work it's going to take, they might they might realize I don't I don't really want it bad enough, and they can save themselves several years. You know. You know, man, there's a girl in our gym right now, and her name is Maddie Sasser. She was an Olympian last year, but she's, she's got dual citizenship. She's um, Marshall, Marshallese. She's from the Marshall Islands, and her dad is American, so she's with us right now. And there is a distinct difference in the way she works versus, like, the, you know, American kids because, you know, she comes from a third-world country, and, like, you know, this weightlifting thing, has gotten her out of that third world country and has kind of shown her the world. And so for her, when she misses a lift, it's like it crushes her soul, you know, and she figures a way to get it. Whereas, you know, Americans are like, whatever. Like the worst case scenario, I'll go home and work for mom or dad. You know, like they don't have that, they don't have that, I don't have an option type of feeling. Like Maddie's like, you know, I'm going to be the best weightlifter that's ever lived because I don't have any other option. And so um, if, if Americans could just, you know, you talk about finding a purpose, if you could just find a purpose that's so great that gave you the same, same feeling as her, then you could be then you could be amazing. And then we could start to medal in the Olympics. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's um, it's hard to really replicate that feeling. And I don't I don't pretend to, to know what it was like growing up in a family like that. My you know, my thing was. I went through uh, drug rehab and, and spent years and years in recovery. And so that's kind of my, that's kind of my rock, my base. Um, right. And I, you know, I don't, I don't think it's, 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 it is, it is impossible to replicate that kind of thing for the average person. But I think simply spending the time to figure out what your purpose is and trying to stay grateful, right? I think people take, take for granted the things that they have and then, you know, when times get rough, they, they just give up. And so I think by practicing gratitude, um, by simply thinking what your life would be like if you didn't have the things that you love, right? That's a good way to get grateful. Um, I think that I think that can go a long way, but you know, it's never going to replicate what it was like growing up to be you and having that chip on your shoulder and stuff like that. But I think it can, it can definitely help. Right. Yeah. It can definitely help. So do you think there are any secrets to building strength or power or speed? Uh, anything that, you know, the best that you've seen are doing that others aren't other than what you just shared? You know, we're talking about, just, you know, power and speed is, is, you know, you're talking about for football or what do you, in what, in reference to what sport are you talking? Uh, weightlifting. Oh, I'm talking about weightlifting. Yeah. Like, you know, you know, I do think I focus more on, uh, you know, attacking weaknesses than most other uh, weightlifting coaches. I think that, you know, my powerlifting background has, you know, helped me, like, number one with that. Number two with just, like, getting strong. I think some reason in America we have a culture, like, um, where it's all about, you know, being an efficient weightlifter, which, look, I'm all about technique and efficiency, but I also know this. I mean, all the greatest weightlifters I've ever known are unbelievably strong. And so, like, if you don't get strong, 
it doesn't matter how good your you know, technique is. I mean, for example, like uh, look at Piers Dimas, who's you know I'm anxious to hear him talk and see what he thinks. Mm-hmm. Here's all I know is that the dude squatted 727 pounds, so that would make wow. him an inefficient weightlifter. But what it did right. make it, it would it might he might have been inefficient, but what he was it was a three time gold medalist. Mm-hmm. So I'll take you know you can call me inefficient all you want if I'm winning gold. I'm beating you, right. so, you know, so like, I mean, so I think that, you know, um, a little bit more focus on just getting strong. I think um, there's also a culture, it would appear in weightlifting to where they've done things a certain way for a long time. And like, if anybody has any new ideas, it freaks them out to the point where instead of thinking logically, they'll just like lash out verbally and just like, um, you know, get mad. And so even when... This, you know, you got a guy like me who's only been in the sport three years and all of a sudden I'm beating everybody. Instead of like saying, you know, what, you know, what are you doing? They would rather lash out and be like, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Well, I'm beating you. So I know something, you know, and um, in, in weight in powerlifting, it doesn't seem to be the, the case as much. You know, it seems like when I was powerlifting, even the guy that I might compete against. If, if I saw his squat go way up, I would call him and be like, what are you doing? And he would tell me and then I'd try it. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be like, oh, that's stupid. I'd be like, well, let me try it. It's working. And so um, so just to – to like for another example is like I have a belt squat machine in my gym now. And so now I'm getting lots of like questions about like, so since when does a weightlifting team use a belt squat? I mean like here's my thing is this. is like if every team in America isn't using it and I am, that gives me an advantage. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to find stuff that they don't do. Right. Like why? Why in the hell would I try to copy everybody when nobody is sending people to medal to the Olympics? And my goal, my job, is to like get these athletes to become medalists, not just make it there. So like I got to step outside the box, Michael. I got to do things differently. Sure. I got to at least try something different. And um, if in America, if we could just like get outside that comfort zone and be like, let's try it. And, like, don't just look at it and formulate some kind of hypothesis. Like, actually try it, and then you got a, l- a little bit of research behind you, you know. But so those are some of the things I would do. I would, like, you know, step outside the box. Let's get strong. Bell squats, reverse hypers. I mean, those things get you strong. I know. I mean, I squatted 805 raw. And so what did I do? I did all these things. So now I'm trying to teach my athletes the same thing. Mm-hmm. And we're and, and with your kids, you're, you're – I mean, this is new territory. You're trying to get people to compete at an international level without steroids, right? So you yeah. have to try new things. If they're going I, to compete I, with I, people on juice, then they've got to be experimenting with what works for each individual. Right. I mean, I got to – so that's a great point. So I, number one, I got to find like the best – you know genetics in america and then i gotta take those genetics and do the best that i can with them to go against guys from other countries who also have good genetics who are on steroids so then you got to do things way better than them and so like that's a, you know that brings me to another point like why in the hell do we want to copy russians and why do we want to copy bulgarians when obviously we we know i mean russia got kicked out of the olympics man so why in the hell do we want to copy them mm-hmm. like i don't want to copy them i mean they take drugs they're cheaters so I don't care about their research because their research is what? Flawed because they're on drugs. You know, so like I want to take the strength and conditioning coaches and the exercise scientists, you know, people like Andy Galpin. I want to I want to work with those dudes uh, to figure out better ways in America like that that works for our athletes. Right. So that's what I'm trying to do. Right. I've heard you say a few times that you're not like the most technical coach. Um, and then on the other hand, I've, I've heard – numerous people talk about how you bring the best out in them. How do you do that? I mean, uh, you know, I would definitely consider myself, you know, somewhat technical, but it's not like what I, you know, like I'm not going to uh, like overanalyze somebody Mm -hmm. and then cause paralysis by analysis. I mean, you know, uh, I do have a coach in my gym who's amazing at technique. You know, I've got Don McCauley, but what I'm, what I'm trying to do is, is say, as little as possible to get the result I want. Like if I'm, if a person is not, you know, staying over the bar, I'm going to try to give them to stare over the bar with actually, actually, without actually thinking about it. So I'm going to use, normally I'm going to use some kind of exercise or if a person is leaving the bar out in front, I'm going to figure a way to do that without them having to think so much. It ha- I mean, you, 
look, you're a great CrossFitter, but you, you're really good at weightlifting too. So you know it happens so fast, man. Like, and for me to like just like give you like 19 verbal cues, it nothing's going to change. Right. So, um, you know, and then another thing is just getting the athlete to believe themselves. One thing that a lot of coaches don't do is they don't they don't work enough with with mindset. So like um, right now, I have the the privilege of the, the girl Maddie Sasser living with me. So when she first got here, her best was 89 snatch and a 114 uh, cleanser, which was five and a half weeks ago. So when she first got here, I, w- I told her that by the American Open, we were going to do 95 and 120, which she laughed at first because, you know, we only had like eight, eight, eight or nine weeks. Mm-hmm. So she laughs day one. So then, you know, she hits 90 on uh, snatch and then she hits a 115 cleanser. And then um, I, next day, I'm like, you look, 95 and 120. She snickers a little bit. Well, then she does 92 snatch, and she does 117 uh, clean jerk. Now I say 95 and 120, and then she starts to like nod as in, oh, yeah, maybe I can. It's all about right. you know shifting the mindset. If you talk to a psychologist, then you know like it's all about – you know, an athlete has a paradigm. This is what they view reality as. So, like, obviously her reality was 89 and 114. My job as a coach is to shift that up a notch. And so I got to make her believe that she's capable of much more, which she really is. I mean, she's definitely capable of way more. But until she believes it, it doesn't matter what I think. So Right. No, man, uh, that, that lands so well with me. I talk constantly about the fact that the results in our lives are – directly from our thoughts and our beliefs, right? And and if we can change those thoughts and beliefs, then that's going to change our emotions, then behaviors and thus our results, right? So by by giving her a little more confidence, she's going to, she's going to do things a little bit differently. She she might, you know, those mundane things might be a little bit easier for her to stick to. Uh, She, you know, she believes that she can make the lift, which we know is a huge part of consistency. Um, that's, that's so huge. That's awesome to hear you say. I love it. I mean, she's right there. Like yesterday, she cleaned 119 for the first time ever, three times and missed the jerk three times. So she is right there at that 120. Wow. I'm pretty confident that she's going to hit it. So, um, she's just an amazing athlete. So she's about to do amazing things in America. That's so. crazy. Those are some records. Oh, she's way above the records. Wow, right. man. She, so right now, here's an, here's another thing. So instead of looking at American records, I'm going to be honest. I could give a crap less about American records because that's all the other American coaches think about. So now we started looking at what the um, Pan American records are. Mm-hmm. And then we're starting to talk about, so what did win the 58s at the Olympics last year? Mm-hmm. We're starting to look at those numbers. Right. Then American records, like, yeah, like she's going to open up, I mean, between you and me, which – I don't know if this will air before the American Open, but she's gonna, she's going to open up with the American record in the clean and jerk, and right. so yeah, so like uh, she's going to annihilate that, and so but it's all about like instead of looking at American records, look at something bigger, man. It's like there's so something to the whole like shoot for the stars, you know, at least you'll land on the moon. There's right. definitely something to that, you know. Absolutely, that's awesome, man. Let's talk about your uh, powerlifting for a little bit. Uh, all right, t- what were your what were all your numbers? Remind me. I mean, in I mean, in raw, raw, I've yeah, done raw first. Eight oh five, a five fifty bench, and um, an eight hundred four deadlift. So Jesus. those are my. Jesus. And then what those, about uh, with equips, the suit? Yeah, I've done a thousand fifty bench, a thousand fifty deadlift, and a thousand fifty squat. Wow. Eight hundred five, eight hundred five deadlift, and a seven twenty two in competition, and a seven eighty five in training bench press. And then the eight hundred four, I just you know, eight hundred four is eight hundred four. So the eight hundred four. Yeah was raw so your best deadlift ever was raw yeah is that like yeah i mean i guess i I guess equipment doesn't really help much at all it really didn't help me man and i I wasn't very good at getting um other than the bench press obviously i wasn't very good at getting as much as some people do with equipment but um and i didn't use you know like i didn't use like the canvas squat suits everyone uses Mm -hmm. um so i I mean i don't know and i didn't want to like yeah i like to train raw because you know even back then we're people didn't talk so much about because there wasn't really a raw federation but even back then like i wanted to make sure that nobody would ever try to say well he's not strong raw so right. I, I would do most videos and most of my training raw and so no one ever dared call me out right. raw. <laughs> yeah. that's badass man uh yeah. so w- there are a ton of uh injuries in powerlifting so i'm assuming you must have had some injuries along the way you know 
I, here, here's where my genetics were. I think this is what helped ah. me the most as an athlete is I didn't receive my first major injury until I was 33 years old. And so, um, I think like you got a guy like Greg Knuckles who like genetically was stronger earlier than I was, but like, you know, one thing that he struggles with is like little nagging injuries all the time. And so like, like my biggest blessing as an athlete was going injury free, but then by the time I was 33, once it started, it was there. And I think and I trained so hard, Michael, like, um, yeah, you know, I, I only, the only coach I had was, was, um, uh, Louis Simmons, but he didn't live, you know, near me. And so it was really on my own. And, you know, I beat myself to a pulp trying to beat everyone. And, right. Um, I think if I'd had someone to tell me, you know, chill out, live to fight another day, like I could have even gone longer without an injury. But, you know, anyone who trained, I would, I would love to see someone train like me nowadays and just see if they could stand it. Like, Mm -hmm. I just don't think most human, like, I know I don't train my athletes like I did myself. Like they would die. I'm pretty sure they would, it was uh, insane. No one around me trained like I did. Like, now I had plenty of training partners by then, but everyone would just laugh and shake their head. So, right. You know, it's, it's funny I think a lot of the best CrossFit athletes that that's one of the defining defining characteristics, right? None of the the best of the best. I can't think of them having like a very significant injury ever, um, you know, in in their in their competitive career, like one that takes them out for an entire season or something like that. Um, not so they're not necessarily more powerful or or have better endurance or whatever, but they're just able to train more consistently. So I think if if people look at that and they say, okay, if maybe I don't have those genetics, but I need to make sure that I don't get injured. Um, as long as they're training consistently, they're going to continue getting better. But I think when people try to push it too far and get those, you know, faster gains, um, yeah. that's when they really get in trouble because they, they take themselves out for six months to a year and then they're, you know, two steps back. Man, it's huge. It's, it's a great point. Like, you know, I would like, whether you're doing weightlifting or powerlifting or even CrossFit, instead of like looking at the whole thing as like a sprint, you should look at it as a marathon. And just, you know, if you just get improvement every single year and you don't get hurt, add that up. You know, right. if you for the next 10 years see improvement yep. and the dude who's way ahead of you gets hurt a lot, by the end of 10 years, you're winning and they're losing. It's exactly what happened with me. Like, you know, when I started out, I was not the best powerlifter in the world. I was pretty good, but there's plenty of people ahead of me. And just each year, I took them down and took more down and took more down until at the end of it, I, it was just basically I outlasted them. And like, now I'm now I'm winning, no one's close to me. Right. So if people would take that, even if I would have taken even, if I could have taken my genetics to stay healthy and like really train a little bit smarter, I mean, I think I would have been even better, but you know, so that's what I try to pass on to my athletes now. What do you think? So you're, you're, I, I consider you a very high energy coach and, and just person in general. Is that something that you, you get from, you know, growing up or, uh, anything like that? Or is that more from your time in powerlifting? Man, that's a valid question. Like, um, I've always been like this. It's always like, you know, I'm a, very emotional person you know it's uh it's just who i am and you know i'm i'm a fiery i guess maybe that was caused from being a shorter athlete trying to play division one football but um like i can't watch one of my athletes pr and not get excited like i mean as a deal tell you like i mean i probably get more excited than they do like and like i'm not just gonna sit there with my arms crossed and be like well pretty good job like i can't do that like I'm fired up. I'm I'm throwing plates. Like I've thrown more chairs than my athletes in the gym. You know, <laughs> so I don't know. It's just who I am. You know. Yeah, it's that that that's another thing that I don't know if it's um, I don't know if you can just kind of will yourself into that kind of uh, personality, but it's damn sure effective. You know, uh, of in in all of the SEC weight rooms that I've been in, every single one of them are fucking fired up all the time when the yeah. guy, when the guys are in there, right? When the athletes are in there, they're oh. fired up because if they, if they want the athletes the, the, you know, the whole philosophy is if you want the athletes to be fired up and given it everything they have, when they, you know, they just got off of school, they got to practice for four hours later and you're asking them to throw around heavy weights in the middle of the day, then you got to be fired up. And so yeah. I think that's something that, 
I think that's something that, you know, should definitely be considered um, in weightlifting gyms, CrossFit gyms, et cetera. Like the, your, your culture, your environment is so, so important. So bringing that I, energy is, is so important. You know, the head strength coach for Florida Gators right now mm -hmm. is Miles. He was my strength coach when I was at Appalachian State University. Okay. And that, that dude, Mike Kent, shout out to Coach Mike Kent. But of all the coaches on my team, I mean, I left there closer with him than all of them just because that dude was crazy. I mean, every yeah. morning, 5 a.m. every morning, you know, you're like dragging yourself in there to work out. And that dude's like screaming, going crazy, playing loud music. And so you had no choice but to get jacked up. You know? mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mimic him. Yeah, man. I mean, strength and conditioning coaches at, at the collegiate level – um, are some of the, the most hardworking, energetic people I've ever met. It's such a it's such a cool profession. I love it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I was really close to doing you know the strength and conditioning, which would be it would not be a hard transition for me because all, a lot of my really better friends are strength and conditioning coaches. Like um, Jonas Ration is the head strength coach for University of North Carolina, the basketball team, the Tar Heels, and so you got Mike, you know, Mike Kent is at Florida. You know, you've got. Um, Big house, Joe Ken that you're, I think, I don't know if you've talked to him yet. But yeah, you're about we're talking to. soon. Yeah, so uh, at the Panthers. So it's definitely something I consider. But the, the thing that, once again, that makes me a little different from people is, like, my family. And, like, I'm not saying these dudes – I mean, I, Coach Ken is a great family man. But I I am I guess I, call me soft, but I love being with my son. And, like, Rock and I are, like, like partners. And so, like, I'm not going to do anything at this point. It's going to take me away from him any more than I have to be. Right. No, and they and they have to fucking grind all Gr the time, man. Right. All the time. You know, collegiate and professional sports are just so competitive that, right. you know, these guys are putting in 80 hours a week, sometimes all year long, depending on the program. So I, I definitely understand what you're saying, and it's and it's and it comes down to priorities, right? I'm not doing that, man. My wife, you know, Emily Drew is like – I mean, she is my best friend. A D will attest. Like, I just can't. Like, I love my family, man. I can't do it. I couldn't do it physically. I mean, I could if I had to support my family. Don't get me wrong. Let's say that weightlifting in America went back to the old ages and nobody cared anymore. I mean, I would do it to support my family, but I'd be wrecked inside. I would miss them so bad. Right. Yeah. You have any good uh, stories of training with Shane Hammond back in the day? You know, I have plenty of good stories. Training, oh yeah. Let me tell you two. First, I met Shane Hammond at the 1996 Junior Nationals of Powerlifting, and uh, I had just won my weight class. So I'm wear, wearing around my medals, thinking I'm big shit and everything. And then, bro, this guy goes out and squats 1,008 pounds right before my eyes. I took my medal and tucked it in my shirt, and that was it, <laughs> because I was just yeah, I mean, he was amazing. But training with him, you know, uh, it was amazing. You, you just see stuff like, you know, nowadays I can even say that, you know, coaching like uh, Nathan Damron, when you watch him squat, it's like, you know, even I'm a great squatter, but there's something about Nathan watching him squat that it looks so effortless that I just get, you know, enthralled in what he's doing. Same thing with Shane, like no matter what he was doing, it's like it wasn't necessarily how much, it was the way he did it like you know i've seen him do 800 pound triples you know raw with a weightlifting belt and it was uh it was effortless man it was just like you know you know he's anyone who's ever seen like 365 kilos on a weightlifting bar like and you've seen it like you know you know weightlifting bar has a lot of oscillation and the way it didn't even phase that man like you know it could be the bar is going crazy and it's not budging this big man and right. he's, he's he's doing it like i would do 100 you know like i would do 60 kilos He's doing 365 kilos, and I, yeah, amazing. Me. But one time, there was this dude, uh, Corey Wilkes, <laughs> God rest his soul. Like he got, he's dead now. He got in a motorcycle wreck. But Corey Wilkes, I don't know, I can't even remember what he was saying. Now Corey Wilkes was a uh, back then, an 85 kilo or whatever it was back then. It was 80 something kilos back. You know, they switched the weight classes since 2000. But uh, Corey Wilkes was an amazing athlete. He looks similar to. Um, uh, What's his name? Uh, gosh, what's the great 94? Kendrick Ferris. He looks like right. Kendrick Ferris. An amazing athlete. And he starts talking junk to Shane Hammonds. I have no idea why. <laughs> and, like, I, I know that I'm in between them 
on platforms at the Limit Training Center. And I'm just thinking to myself, this could get ugly. And so, oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. And he just keeps on messing with him. And I, once again, I think that I was so afraid for his life that I, I, I don't even know what he was saying to him. You know, like if he was calling him, you know, fat or if he was talking about his mom. But all of a sudden, Shane Hammonds, he, he had a, a, a bar above his head, like something amazing. Who knows, like what, 200 plus kilos and throws the bar <laughs> and then runs after this dude. And this dude, you, you should have seen him. He looked like a bobcat, how quick he moved right. to get away from Shane. He's running all over the gym and then he goes in the office and hides behind, you know, uh, Dragomir, the coach. And I'm just like, it was the funniest thing because the dude never gets mad. And but he threw he threw 400 pounds from above his head at this guy. Good and God! I know, man. Like, like why you would even test that? Man. Right. Like, Michael. Like, I, like most A type men, you know, you go into a room and you you, you know you see the biggest, strongest dude, and, and um, say you know we all do it. Like you size him up and you think about. You know, could I beat this guy? How At least you would I, kill him if you had to, right? If I had to, how would I? <laughs> how would I do it? And like, for the you know the year or two that I was at the training center, I analyzed Shane, and I come to the conclusion that there was no winning. <laughs> right. Like I, I thought about everything. Well, if I kicked him in the knee, bro, his knee is bigger than my thigh. Jeez. Like I think if I kicked him in the knee, it would hurt my foot. So, I don't. I you know. So I guess the conclusion was just be nice to him and don't make him mad. Right. But, God damn. Yeah. You think so hanging he, out with guys like that had a big impact on your mindset, hanging out with people of such quality? Well, I think, man, I got, you know, uh, I call it luck or call it fate, but like early on, I was around some crazy people. Like my first, um, so when I graduated college, I went, to, I did one year of powerlifting before I went to Colorado Springs to do weightlifting. And the very first person I met in powerlifting was Louis Simmons. So that was amazing. And then um, the second person was Kurt Kowalski, who was this world champion powerlifter. Mm -hmm. Then I moved to the Olympic Training Center. The very first human being I met in um, in Colorado Springs was Wes Barnett, the two-time Olympian. And so he was my first coach, my first weightlifting coach. So And then my second weightlifting coach was Dragomir, the Olympic bronze medalist. Mm -hmm. And so – from there, while I was there, I met Charles Pollock and, you know, yep. arguably the best strength conditioning coach in the world. And then um, from there, Dr. Leahy, arguably the best chiropractor that's ever been, the guy who invented active release technique. Right. Like, it was, this was my path, man. Yeah. Then I met Coach Ken. Then I met, it's like, I don't know if, I don't know if, you know, if God willed this to happen or what. I mean, I believe that, but like, you don't have to believe it. But like, just people were put in my path. And so, yeah, I think it had a direct effect the way I think, the way I coach, the you know, the way my I take my business, the way I take my family, mm -hmm. it's just these people is were just put in my path. And um, you know, even where I played football in Appalachian, like the very first day, here's where I come of age right here. My very first day, of, and I'm not saying I was a great football player. I was good enough to get there, but like my the coach comes in and he says, um, man. You know, just like any other year, his name's Jerry Moore. He's a great coach, but he's the coach when they beat Michigan. But he says, just like every year, our our job is to win the national championship. We were one double A, you know. And I knew right then and there, I was in the right place, and that was my, you know. Then I knew I was like, this is the mindset I need to take, you know. I fucking but, love that. Is there? How did you end up out of all of these places? Did you find these coaches and then go seek them out, or just happen to be so? Bro. You know, like, let me give an example of, like, uh, Charles Pulligan. Like, I was at his – he had a seminar. He, back in the 90s, like, he was in Colorado Springs working with uh, T Nation, Testosterone Magazine or whatever back then. And um, he had a seminar, and I went to the seminar, and he's talking about front squats and how these um, Bob Sledders from Canada are so strong at front squat. And I whispered to my friend, I'm like, you know, I don't think that's very strong. But I wasn't – now, I wasn't trying to be – disrespectful but he saw me and he calls me out and he says do you think you're stronger and i said i know good and well i'm stronger and then he stops the whole thing makes me front squat and of course you know <laughs> i crushed the canadian front squatter and and then he's like then he gave me a six-week internship with him and no shit yeah yeah so, <laughs> so I, I don't know so is that me seeking him out or is that me just like 
getting super lucky. You know, I don't know. Right, right. So, um, like, in Louis Simmons, you know, once he saw, like, you know, he's the one who came to me. He saw me lifting, and, you know, he took interest in me. Like, uh, Dr. Lee, he, I definitely, you know, sought him out just to, like, because back then he used to, like, work on all the, you know, the guys at the training center for free. And so I saw him out, and he, so, like, that was kind of cool to get. Not only was it cool to get to work with a great chiropractor like that, but it was cool to see a guy who was so innovative. And uh, now he's, a, he's an unbelievable entrepreneur. It's the fact that he uh, invented active release technique. And that now, like, man, he makes who knows how much money that dude makes certifying people in active release. But just to meet these quality people that just, like, you know, did such big things. Or another one, for example, um, Colorado Springs back then was the place to be, but Tim Patterson, the uh, editor in chief for T Nation, like that guy, like I mean, I hung out with him as if I'm hanging out with you. Like it was before they were so big too. So I think nowadays it might be a little bit bigger deal, but back then it was just I was meeting all the right people at all the right time. Right. Yeah. You've been in it for a long ass time. Long time, man. I think you know that has to do with just treating people right. You know, right. like. A lot of people make the huge mistake. You know, you get in business and you meet people like Mike Bledsoe or like you, and uh, you say you say to yourself, you know, what can these people do for me? And that's the complete opposite of what I did. I, you know, like when I met Black Mike Bledsoe, I sincerely liked him as a friend, and like I just wanted to do stuff for him. Mm-hmm. But in turn, like it just worked out to where we did stuff for each other. And then if people would just do that, like you know. If you want to get to know me because you want to learn things from me, that's cool. But if you sincerely like me, you know, maybe you should just consider, like, maybe I could do stuff for him, too. You know, like, right. you can stay in this industry a lot longer with that type of attitude. Right. That's a phenomenal perspective. So let's let's wrap it up with this. Um, you've been, in the past three, four, five years, you've gotten into – online training and, and selling different types of programs. What right. have you, what have been some of the biggest lessons you've learned from doing that kind of work? Yeah. I mean, probably the same lesson a lot of us have just the same as, is like, you know, having great systems in place is so important. Like, uh, you know, but like a lot of us, you know, you start it and you say, let's try this and see what happens. And you, and you don't start with the, you know, with the vision that it could be huge one day. And so next thing you know, it is pretty big now you're struggling because you don't have a good system. So like, you know, the, the biggest lesson is like now I have, you know, I have a COO and she, like her job is to take, you know, my crazy ideas and to, to make them systematic to where we can move on to the next thing and, you know, still have that going. But like just to think of things like when you have an idea and you want to put it out there, number one, don't just see somebody else doing something and do the exact same thing because that just saturates things. And since you're coming in after that person, that person has a better, you know, He's got a better chance than you do. So, like, what you want to do, you know, get some ideas, sure. But then think about what can you do better and how can you offer something different. And then go into it with the with the vision that if this thing gets big like I want it, what kind of system will I need and start with that system. Mm-hmm. So another Another good one is just simply document every step you take when you're creating a program or when you're, you know, delivering that program to an athlete or how you communicate with each other, simply write down and document everything that you do so that when the time comes that you grow big enough to hand that off to someone, right. To hand that role off, then they can, then they have a step-by-step approach. One. And that's a huge, huge Mm -hmm. thing that, that I've had to learn because I'm a, you know, I'm a very, um, I'm a very high, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think in the Colby test, um, you know, idea guy, very, very low follow through and, and, and system maker. Right. And so I'll have all these ideas in my head and all of these plans in my head and, and stuff like that. And I don't, and I'll, I'll tell someone, Hey, I want you to do this and, and expect them to do it just the same way that I would do it without giving them any direction. Right. And so it's not in my Me nature too to write those kinds of things down. So just like you were saying, like if you're if you're not the type of person to sit down and write a very detailed plan, then get someone that does, right? As soon as you can afford it, um, and even if you, usually a little bit sooner than you think you can afford it, having someone like that on board, if you're, if you're the typical entrepreneur, you know, idea generator, innovators, et cetera, then you need someone that is organized and that can, can put these systems together for you. 
Amen, brother. Exactly. You have any so, any other tips for people that are doing online programming or, or anything in the online fitness community uh, that can help them serve their athletes better? I mean, yeah, man. Like you know, try to like think of like exceeding expectations. Like um, talking to you know Alex from Barbell Shrug. You know, he, he stayed with me for about a week, and it was cool to be around him. But to like you know like. You know, we all like, here's the thing. We all know that hey, we have what we consider a good program. And then we do the, the Facebook groups and, um, you know, we might do video analysis within this Facebook group. Like things that you can give that are outside that. Like what if you make a library of videos on mobility and so like they can go in there and just check through all the different ways to like ankle mobility, knee mobility. My point being, try to exceed those expectations. Right. Like do things – that you don't don't just do the things that you offered when you try to get them to sign up like go above and beyond those things and then what i would also do if you're trying to come into the online market like look at what people are already doing give those things away for free and then charge for something even better right if you do that you'll be successful for sure for sure um i think it's kind you know the online market is a lot like CrossFit gyms in general, right? It, it, when when yeah. CrossFit first started, you could get away with anything, right? You could put up put put a couple barbells and kettlebells in an empty basement with no air conditioner, and and you know coaches are showing up late, etc. And there's no systems, but it works really well because it's the only CrossFit gym in town, and people fucking love only it. Can. Now yeah. there's a CrossFit gym. There's five within a mile, right? Same thing with yeah. online market, like they they have so many choices. So how are they, how are you going to differentiate yourself? You have to be more organized. You have to be become, you know, start becoming a, a real business and you have to, you know, people expect a high quality out of you if they're going to stick with you. So you have to be continually providing that kind of quality. Absolutely, man. Like, yeah, you just got to be, you know, nowadays the CrossFit gyms are learning, like you better be the best in town or you'll be the ones that are closing down. I mean, right. like, so like same thing online market like every, now you, every time I go on Instagram somebody else is like saying hey email me for online coaching I'm like <laughs> you're way too late to the game man I mean like but um yeah and you just got to think of like how can you do something a little bit different you know? right don't be that guy like, you're you're never gonna get you number one you're gonna be spending a lot of time making very little if you're the guy that says hey email me and I'll be your online coach if you're that guy you're gonna be broke so right. Well, you know, for for guys like us, as you know, sometimes it's 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 uh, maybe frightening to see how many new people are are in the space. But at the same time, as as a Type A person, as an entrepreneur, yeah. as a, a man in general, and and, and for women for sure, but uh, I think a, a masculine trait. This is kind of a masculine trait to 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 love that challenge. Oh yeah. Um, you know, it really just fires me up and it's, and it's, and, and I'm definitely, I'm, I'm constantly reminded that there's more than enough to go around, right? That whole abundance mentality, there's more than enough to go right. around and, and we're, we're all constantly challenging it's each other to provide more and more value for people so that they're getting, you know, people from any corner of the world can get top quality, uh, training, nutrition, lifestyle advice, et cetera. Right. Um, no matter, you know, they don't have to be next to the, the best gym in the country to get top level coaching and, and training. It's pretty cool. I agree, man. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm definitely like, you know, I don't care if 10 billion people come to do online coaching. Like, it, it, there's so many people out there. And so, yeah, it hasn't affected me. Like, you know, I've even had people like, you know, John North. I mean, he's my good friend. He used to be one of my athletes. And now he does, you know, pretty much the exact same thing I do with, um, you know, the Dark Orchestra. I just gave them a shout out. Like, you know, like by all means, try him, try us. You know, like we're so so different. People that will like him probably won't like me. You know, so it's perfect. I love that dude. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, do you have anything else you want to say before we wrap it up? Man, no. Just thanks for having me on. Um, you know, can I can I give my website a shout out? Absolutely, please. Yeah, yeah just, just go talk about all your shit. Yeah, just go to masterleague.com. That's the main thing I want you to do. <laughs> awesome. So go there, sign up for the newsletter. That's about it. Hell yeah. And then what about social media? Where can they follow you? You go to Instagram, you know, at Master League Performance. You know, that's – I'm also on Facebook, you know, Master League Performance. And um, Twitter, I throw your curveball, and it's just Master League, So Shit. Press pause. Write that down, guys. 
<laughs> Hell yeah, brother. I appreciate right, this. Man. This is great, man. Thanks so much for your time. All right. Tell a DL lover. I will. Later, buddy. All right, man. See ya.